Yugoslavian or any of that kind of stuff, uh, except that I can tell you that it's likely not English. So when you're, when you're looking at old stuff, culture makes a big difference in how it's designed and how it's made and how you can date it. Uh, so when you say, what did, a, what did an old lock look like? It's kind of like saying, what does an old house look like? So it's uh, the, the, where it comes from, what are the, what's the background of the people that built it and used it has a lot to do with how it, it looks. So again, most of my knowledge is about English work, and, and so that's what I can share with you today. Um, I did bring, well, so I did bring uh, an, an exception to that, and maybe, I don't know if you can focus in on the table here, there, is a, there are a couple pieces here that, are, that don't belong in that group of English work. Anyone want to hazard a guess which of those things don't belong in the English? The eyeglass case, yeah, all right. <laughs> you caught me. All right, you win the prize. <laughs> yeah, that's from China, I think. Yeah. Anyone, anything else? The, the, the lock with the uh, brass knob on. This one here? Yeah, well, that's a good, good guess. Anyone concur or? Vehemently oppose. What about the padlock? What about the padlock? Yeah. So here, we'll put the cover back on this so you can see it in its glory. Uh, any other thoughts? Um, that, that lock with the, the round uh, you know, the on this side. Yeah. So this is a, yeah, this is. This is a lock. This is called a spring lock, and it, the bolt is pushed by a spring. So it's, uh, well, I have to say, all these guesses are great, but you missed it. <laughs> so this, uh, this, these are the locks that are not English. This is a trunk lock, or a chest lock. Well, I need those glasses more and more. So, yeah, I made, uh, yeah, I made all of these. They're all copies of antiques. So they're the same size and finish and, all right. So this is a, this is a lock. Some people call these crab locks. And this is on the lid. This would be on the inside of the box, and when the lid closes, well, if I can make my arm is the lid, the lid closes, and the arrowhead springs the jaws apart and then uh, snaps shut behind it. So these are really a lot of fun, I think, because they're simple parts. Well, this is this uh, kind of a lock with a round spring is found all over Europe. This particular one, the original, was made by a German immigrant in living in Pennsylvania. But he worked in a German community and he made locks for the blanket chests and dower chests. So he's he, he dated and signed several of the locks he made, and the, the other, there are three of them, three, three others I know about besides the one that I have, and they're in the 1780s, all three of them. So this is a standard English house door lock um, from Start probably 1760 up to about 1850. They were almost the same. There were a few subtle changes, but.
Uh, and I, th I believe this is the way they looked when they were new. Well, almost. So, glossy black paint, polished knobs, bright screw, screw tips. Um, and Is that exposed, the black on the door? Yeah, this would be a surface mounted lock. Let's see, let's, let's say this is the door. This gets mounted right on the surface. So almost all hardware from this period is surface mounted. Only the very fanciest locks from this period are mortised into the door itself. So here's a cheaper version of this same lock. What did they use to mount it to the surface with? Screws or nails, sometimes bolts. So either wood screws, nails, or bolts. So the lock is only as strong or secure as what mounted it to the surface. Well, actually, no, because uh, the lock is mounted on the inside of the door. The door swings this way. The lock is being pressed against the door if you try to force the door. However, you're right in a sense, the weak link is the, is the keeper, what, what modern people call a strike. So that is put on to the jam or onto the yeah, casing with two screws. That's all that holds that. Would screws have been hand filed? Uh, screws were made, I've examined a lot of old screws and I have, I can see three different methods for making wood screws in the 18th century. Hand filing was one and that was not very common. It was done, if you're, they show up most often on guns. A, a gun needs seven screws. So if you're making a gun, it's not an unreasonable thing to make the screws for it. But screws that were made for installing hardware were commercially made. And they were either lathe turned or die cut with a, with a threading die. Uh, they were quite common at this time, but more expensive. So they tend to be used on, in two instances. One where you have to take the thing off periodically and the second is if it's a fancier installation, they use screws. So there, in the English lock, there are five, well, four, yeah, well, actually six, six screws that hold the parts together on the inside of the lock. So uh, the idea of using screws was pretty common then. It's just more work than making a nail, and so it was a little more expensive fastener. So that's one of the things that distinguishes Eng English locks from a lot of the European locks like this, which are riveted together and can't come apart easily. Um, let's see, what else? What else should we talk about? Was there a an attitude of Screws are better, or rivets are better, or? Well, each one's better for different reasons. You know, like, uh, you know, screws are more expensive. They're more genteel. Um, they allow you to remove the thing and put it back on again. But uh, <coughs> some pe to some people, Cheaper means better. To some people, stronger means better. To some people, better appearance or nicer appearance, cleaner appearance means better. So uh, it's, it's really tempting to think there are simple answers that you can, but people's values in the 18th century were just as muddled as they are today. Well, yeah, so what's the best fastener you can use now? Which one is the best? <laughs> <laughs> See, already there's a controversy. We've got two different, 
in your research, is this kind of stuff talked about in documents, or are you reasoning from what you were able to find physically? Uh, well, there's very little, um, there isn't a single document source that tells you all this. Oh, yeah. so, uh, so the time I spent at Williamsburg allowed us to look through all kinds of documents and one of the things that, that the, one of the documents that survive relating these locks are the, the local store inventories. So they list the locks in their inventory and what they cost. So it tells you, you can't, you can't really tell when they say best lock, one pound, four shillings, you don't know what that is. Okay. But um, you can get a range and sometimes they say lock with knobs and then you know it's got to have something like this and uh, they also list screws and sometimes they say, sometimes people at, at that time sent directly to a, an exporter in England. If you were, so, if you were uh, just, just one of the Joes in, in Williamsburg, like us, let's say one of us has happened to be walking down the street in Williamsburg in 1770, um, you could walk into a store and buy just about any kind of house hardware that you needed. Locks, hinges, nails, screws, uh, what else would you need? Uh, slide bolts, shutter hardware. Um, so all those things were right on the shelf. You could, could fork over your money and walk out with the stuff. Yeah? When, when you guys started on the restoration like the governor's mansion, had it been like modified a lot or was it still in yeah, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, in addition to just walk-in customers, there were also wealthier planters, plantation owners, who made their living by uh, raising export crops. They, mostly in Virginia, they raised tobacco and corn for export. And so you could get a better deal if you had enough to export to get your own agent in England and you arrange the shipping and you sent barrels of tobacco to England. Uh, and unfortunately, it was illegal to send hard cash out of England to the colonies. They were trying to maintain their, you know, their currency standards. So you couldn't, you couldn't take large amounts of currency out of England. So if you're a planter in Virginia, <coughs> You sell your crop in England, your agent waits till the price is high, gets the best price for it. Suddenly you have a credit of, you know, 412 pounds, 13 shillings, sixpence. How do you get that money? Well, your agent would keep it, keep an account for you, and then you could use that to buy goods that were cheap in England have them sent to Virginia, and you could either use them for your own use or resell them at a profit. So all these wealthier people are sending to their agents instructions on what to send back. And so often they'll say, I'm, I'm about to build a small building on my property. Please send the following. And it's, uh, you know, six locks, 4,000 nails this size, 10,000 nails this size. Uh, and they'll say uh, 10,000 nails this size for flooring or such and such or locks for closets or lo and so you get a you get an idea of what people call these things and and what they were to be used for and what was the standard kind of choices they had I'm uh, an associated mind. what was the time frame for communication back and forth well, uh, it's a month or two each way. Each way? Yeah. So two to four months yeah. for a reply. So that's yeah. real snail mail. <laughs> sea snail. That's minnow, sea minnow snail. mail. Sail mail. <laughs> Sail mail, yeah. Peter, nobody wrote anywhere about construction of these things or techniques or anything like that. No, and that's one of my favorite topics. Would that have been a guild secret? No, 
Well, no. So my, my uh, take on this is uh, I used to hear these kinds of questions. Well, they, they never wrote anything down because they didn't know how to write and read or they were keeping everything a secret so they didn't want anyone to know about it. But my opinion about why there's nothing written is that it's a really bad way to convey the information. If you have, if you have a journeyman right here and you have a book here, which one do you think is the better way to learn? So the books and written instructions appear when there's no longer a person to learn from. And that's, in this country, you know, around 1900, you know, roughly when the apprenticeship system disintegrated. So it, the, the reason they didn't write things down is not because they were illiterate, it's, it's that it's a waste of time. Why would you bother spending all the time to write this down when a much better system of education already exists without having the trouble of writing it all down? Which is you just go work for that guy and you'll learn a million times more than you ever can from a book. In fact, you all have the books, but you're still here. If those books were good enough, you wouldn't need to come see me. Yeah. So a book, a book is a really bad way of conveying physical skills. And that's, in my opinion, that's why they didn't write things down. Because tradesmen were all trained to read and write. It was part of the apprenticeship contract. In a very real sense, you've been a puzzle solver. In that yeah. Right. So how do, I, how do you know what locks looked like and how they were installed? Well, some, you, so you get some documentary evidence from records. You go find old houses that still have locks on the doors, and then you try to figure out, well, is that the original lock? Has it been moved six times? Is that the original door? And eventually, after you look at enough houses, you start to see patterns, and you can start to identify what, what, it was, what was original. You know, and there are, there's one house uh, near me, right on the line between North Carolina and Virginia, it was built in 1796 by a really wealthy family. They wrote to England for all the materials. They moved out to this kind of frontier area, built a grand house, and uh, then about 30 years later, they went bust. And so, and, and, but it stayed in the same family. They had enough money to keep the house and the property, but not enough to fix it up much. So nothing got changed. And all the correspondence for what they wrote for survived. So all the, all the doors in the house still have their original locks in the same locations. And you can walk through the house with this order list and it says 12 locks for closets. You go to the closet and you open the door and you see what they got. And then it says two best locks for front doors. You can just go down the whole list and you can match it up to what's on the building still. Now, that's really that rare. Exactly. That's how they describe it, you say the best lock? Well, sometimes they didn't ask for best quality. So they would ask two, for two common locks for such and such. Sometimes they just say, please send six locks for chambers. Now. Don't worry, Scott, I haven't forgotten your question. <laughs> uh, so one of the ways that they describe these locks is the function that they perform. So a lot of the really simple locks, like, like this one, has a single bolt. Hang on, I'm going to let me. I lost the key for this one, so we'll have to. All right, so it's got a single bolt. So this lock performs one function. It's a deadbolt. When it's locked, whether you're on the inside of the door or the outside of the door, the only way of unlocking it is with a key. So this only functions as a lock. 
this lock has a key operated bolt. If you're on the outside of the door, the only way to get in is with the key. There's no knob. If you're on the inside of the door, you don't need a key. You can use your finger. So this lock has more a slightly different function than this one. If you're on the inside of the room, you can get out without the key. Is that a different latch on it? No. I mean, it's, you know, it's angled so it'll close. Boom. Nope. Oh, so that's a, you can't see from here that it's a square bolt. You have to physically close it, physically open. You have to physically lock it with the key. And even from the inside, you'd have to pull it back with your finger to close the door. Correct. Why would they have it like that instead of? They are obviously illiterate, ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's. You never, you never leave home without the key. You can't lock the door without the key. Yeah. I, you know, that's a really good question, and I don't know the answer. Um, all I can, my only um, conclusion from that is there were attitudes and common practices that they thought were correct that we don't understand. But I, but, but I don't know. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, it's not because they hadn't thought of it. It's because for some reason they thought it wasn't necessary or not well, wanted in that. You lock it on the way out and make sure you have the key in there. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like when you lock it. Well, if it were doubled and somebody had a credit card. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were safe from the credit card set. <laughs> but they probably did have a knife. These were, the, by several document sources mentioned that these are good for chamber doors, bedroom doors. And so uh, I think you're all thinking correctly, if this was on the front door of the house, you would lock it with the key on the way out. But these were used on the interior doors also. Did they lock all their doors? That way your wife couldn't run away from Well, in the, in, did they lock all their doors? Uh, in some parts of America, there are locks on every every single thing that opens. And in Virginia, that's true. Closets, desks, dressers, cupboards, every door, everything that opens and closes has a lock. Do you think it was because of slaves or? That, that's one of the, that's one of the uh, theories. Yeah, because there were servants and slaves throughout the house. And, that's that's one possibility. I mean, it could have just been conspicuous consumption. I have a uh, dresser. It's called a butler dresser, and has a lock on it. Yeah. And what I've heard is that these were really butler dressers, and they locked it so that the master, the name of the master's son, couldn't come take the butler. Sounds like a good a good story. It's a good story. Yeah. Were all the locks in the house keyed alike? Usually not. Usually they're keyed differently unless you ask for them to be keyed alike, and some requests did. So did you even walk through your own house? You had to have a handful of locks. Well, a handful of keys. Yeah, but so you're assuming that everything was kept locked, and that's the part no one knows. There's a lock on that door, but that doesn't mean it got used. Like in like this, they just leave the door open. Well, I think that's a very distinct possibility, is that the common practice of the day was to leave everything open. Do the locks have a status? Was there a status on what kind of locks you had when you made your lock? Oh, yeah, they're always status for everything. Uh, yeah, so a more expensive lock is more expensive. I mean, and they're visibly, you can tell by looking at them that they're more expensive.
Yeah, well, let me get, before I answer your, I'm going to answer Scott's question before he gives up. So uh, in Williamsburg, uh, which was a actual town in the 1770s, uh, and a lot of the town survived. The, the, it was the capital city, the capital moved, and so the town kind of dried up. But it didn't, it didn't disappear. So there are about 90 buildings surviving there from the 18th century. And then another 300 that didn't survive that have been reconstructed. So about a quarter of the buildings that are there uh, are originals uh, on their original sites. Um, most of the big public buildings did not survive. The Capitol, the Governor's Palace, uh, the courthouse almost survived. Uh, what else was there? The public hospital. All those buildings had some catastrophic demise. That's completely new. Yeah. Yeah, that's completely new. Right. Yeah. Those fires? What? Sometimes. Yeah. Well, yeah. The public buildings tend to burn. Well, the, the governor's palace burned in 1781 during the Revolutionary War. There was no longer a governor living there. Uh, it was being used as a hospital for soldiers that had been wounded in the Battle of Yorktown, 10 miles away. And, and one night it burned, and no one knows how the fire got started, but it wasn't being used as a residence at that point. The public buildings, in my mind, are the ones no one lives in, and so no one's, no one's there all the time. Those are the ones that's more likely for something to go wrong. But houses didn't burn that often in town. I mean, there, there were two or three fires over the 125 years of history there that were serious, but you know, the whole town didn't burn 10 times. Yeah? How many, how many hours in their day was in one of these locks? Oh, I wish I knew how long it took any of these people to make locks back then, but there is no record of that that I'm aware of. So let me change the question. How long does it take you to make locks? Uh, how long does it take me? Uh, it, uh, the first one seems like it takes forever, but if, <laughs> if you make 20 of them, you can cut the time usually by 90%. So how long, now that you know everyone, how long does it take? Well, yeah, now that I know, it's like, okay, now I know which key to play on the piano. N knowing is not what speeds you up, it's right. practicing. Right. Is it safe to assume? Yeah, I would say four times faster. I think any, any of those tradesmen could quadruple my production after I think I've gotten good at it. And so it, right now, it takes me two or three days to make one of these, maybe, maybe a little more. I'll bet, I'll bet they were making three or four in a day. Uh, they have assembly lined. Yeah, not as much as you would think. So m there, there's one. All right. All right. I guess we're going to dive in. Stand back. <laughs> All right. So let me take this apart. So there's one component in the. Well, there are two components in this lock. The brass parts are all castings, so they would come from a foundry. That's not a locksmith's work. So all the brass parts are purchased. And no, the screws were, I think the screws were a part of the locksmith's work. And were there cap and die sets to? Oh, yeah. All right, so now we have the cover plate off. We're, we are going to talk, whether you like it or not, we're going to talk about the way that these locks function. So 
Lock the doors. We're not <laughs> going anywhere. So if you look at the way the key functions in the lock, let's see if we can get this on the screen. I'm going to take this off. So you can see that the key turns around this plate. And this lock just has, let me get a good pointer. Yeah, it has one ward. You'll notice in this lock, there's, there's a ring here. See what I'm, can you see what I'm yep. pointing at? That's as close as I can get in. All right. That's, yeah. It's a, actually a tube, isn't it? It's a, yeah, it's a short tube. And that tube, the key has to have a cutout that corresponds to the location of that tube. So you can see the cutout in the key is this one here. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. So that cutout in the key, if you'll stay in close for a minute, that cutout for the key is what allows the key to pass by that tube. That's a safety feature or a strength for the plate, or both? Well, that's the security system right. in the lock. Now, let's look at the key again. There's another, there's another cutout in the bit of the key. Where is that? Right here. So where in the lock is is that cut out uh, relating to. There's nothing here on this part of the lock, but there is on the cover. So that second cut out, and we call those wards, the obstruction and the slot are both called wards. The key has to have both of those wards in order to pass the wards in the lock. And you could have multiple wards now. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I do. I have two already. Okay, but you could, have, you could have six. You could have additional rings if you wanted. Exactly. You can actually master key. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that is the security system in an English door lock or is, is, so is this a ward. Fancy lock or is this a this is a common lock. Well, a common lock of this grade. This wasn't extra fancy. This was just the standard lock. If you bought this grade lock, this was the standard. Was this a fairly common grade? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll get to your I'm I'm leading up to the answer to that question this okay. this 15 minute segment. So, what was purchased in this lock but from a specialist? The brass parts, all the castings, often the key and the ward plate. And that was called a box of wards. So you would buy from a key maker or a ward maker the key already fitted to its wards. So this one little, this one little plate with the wards brazed to it and the corresponding wards in the key. And the cover plate too? No, that's easy to make. You, gotta, you have to make the cover plate to fit the lock. Okay. Now then would you have bought that cover plate that, and that cover plate is a ward? There is a ward on the, on the and, cover plate. And so would, then would you have bought that cover plate with that ward when you bought the key? And, no. So you'd have had to make that yourself? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Most likely the, the lock, locksmith had a pattern for each key to match a particular plate and then had maybe 20 different patterns or... You just make them up as every one you... you go along. Everyone was different. Yeah, 
you don't have to have a pattern. If you're thinking of modern keys and masters and a record of what, well, none of that applies here. That just came from his creative. Well, no, it just, it, you do it without thinking. You want to make the next lock different from this. All you have to do is try to make them the same. And your natural, <laughs> honest, honest. You, if you say, oh, I'm going to make 10 of these the same, the keys won't fit in all 10. You don't, yeah, yeah, sixteenth of an inch, yeah. So, so these vary just by, without trying, and certainly there's no point in keeping accurate records of what you made for so-and-so. The, 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 the system of manufacture wasn't based on that. Yeah, yeah. So you can exit the file and see. Oh, sure. Yeah, but an English lock is easy to open. Yeah. So, yeah, you don't have to follow those. Yeah, well, you could, there were people made lock picks. You can pick the lock if you have to, to get in. I mean, not. Are there any locksmiths in here? Yeah, so <clears throat> let's say, uh, so you all, you all have a car with a key lock. Well, maybe you don't have a key lock anymore, but when there were locks on cars with keys, how many different keys were there for one model of car, do you think? Four, there were like six. Yeah, yeah. The, you don't have to make every single lock different in the whole world to make them secure. The chances of someone else's key working in your lock, even if they're made by the same person the same day, you know, once those get sent out into the world and you have a key for this lock, the chances of that key fitting someone else's lock are almost zero without even trying. So it's, it's a system that, you know, like you don't have to try to make your handwriting different from everyone else's. It just happens that way automatically. You just don't give it a second thought. You have to try to make it like someone else's. And that's, that's often the case with keys. You don't, you don't need, they don't have to be, I mean, you, don't, you can't make them precise enough to be interchangeable and the chances of you making 10 that are interchangeable and then one, one owner having the opportunity to get into your house is so remote that you don't even have to think so about it. So if you bought a series of locks key to life, was that a lot more money? I don't think so. You know, it just was a special order. It's not a lot more time when you're making the locks because you start with one key and you make all the other locks fit it. It's, it's, I've done it both ways and it's actually easier that way, make them all key to like. Was like the governor's mansion or one of the higher end buildings, did they do master systems? I have no idea. Yeah. All right, so eventually let's get eventually to what I was leading up to, which is we talked about this lock having a single bolt. You need the key from either side to get in or out. There's one that had slightly, like this had one and a half functions. You could get out without the key, but not in. This lock has three functions, has three separate bolts. It has the dead bolt, the one that's operated by the key, and in an English lock, the key operates from both sides. So it has to be a symmetric pattern. Right. So this ward, it's called a bridge ward, is exactly in the middle between the cover and the outer plates. And that's why 
There might be only a single ward on the cover, but let's see. Let's see if we can put this where the camera can see it. So there's only one ward in the cover plate, but the key has to be able to work this way too. All right, so this lock can be deadlocked or opened from either side with the key. It can be deadlocked from the inside with this slide. And, it won't get you in at all. Right. So you can keep out someone with the key for romantic <laughs> excursion. And the third function, what's the third function of this lock? The latch. The latch, exactly. And this latch has the angled bolt face that you were talking about. So this latches automatically when you close the door. <coughs> that angled face hits this brass rub rail. Let's see if we can, yeah, there, that's the right angle. So, and that, re, that retracts the bolt. And then, and so the latch is operated with the knob from either side. So all the functions of this all the functions of this lock, oh, let me turn this so the camera can see it. See that little cam there. All the functions of this lock can be done from both sides except for the privacy bolt, the slide bolt. So, to me, that tells you what kinds of use that the people wanted that door to have. What kinds of, you know, and we don't think about that much in the 20th century because almost anything you buy now has all the functions you want it to have. But originally, you could buy different grades of locks that had some or all of the functions depending on how much money you want to spend and, and what you're likely to do with that door. So a smokehouse door doesn't need a three-bolt lock unless you're going to have your romantic tryst inside there amongst the hams. <laughs> but normally, you only need to lock the smokehouse door from the outside. You never need to lock yourself in. So a single bolt lock with no knob, no latch, works fine for a smokehouse door or the woodshed or something like that. So there's no sense in buying a three bolt lock when a single bolt lock performs all the functions that that door needs. So when, I, when you asked about what grade of lock, this is the standard grade three bolt lock. Front door, bedroom door, uh, what else? That's about it, probably office. Um, even in a lot of good houses, like the dining room or, or the parlor, might not have the privacy bolt. In those cases, they might buy a two bolt lock, dead bolt and latch bolt and leave off the privacy bolt. So that's the other thing that you find in historic hardware is that these incremental levels of function were uh, people, even very wealthy people, didn't buy more than they needed for each door. In a very fancy house, you'll find every grade of lock in the same house starting from the front door to the closets on the third floor. 
They didn't just buy the same thing for every door. That's usually what you see now in a modern structure. They have almost the same hardware throughout. In historic buildings, they only spent the money on the expensive ones where it was necessary. A lot of those doors just have the latch and the knob and the latch. I'm sorry? Do a lot of those doors just have a knob and a latch or everything locked? Uh, no, you could avoid the lock altogether. So here is a latch, which would have a knob. I haven't got the knob for this one, but this is just a latch, no lock. Surface mounted, yep. Has the same, well, so it would, it would look like that. Has the same cam. It's, let me. Oh. <laughs> it's raining. So it has the same knob cam mechanism to lift the latch bolt. Same lock used on houses as places of business? Yep. Yep. So these are, this is your choice for English hardware. And I mean, the thing that's cheaper than this is a thumb latch. So uh, if you're going to step up from a thumb latch but still just have a latch, this is what you'd have. Yeah. I would guess it was by the 1840s and 50s. No, that's so far out of my period of, <laughs> period of study. I. Were there, so these are latches and locks. Okay. Yeah. There's even simpler stuff, things like uh, you know, hooks or right. things that, that would be made, I imagine, locally. That's all sort of. Y Either see. one. Yeah, you could buy really inexpensive hooks, commercially made, or have your local guy make them. Either one. <coughs> so the imports, if you live near the coast, the imports were much cheaper. So it's only when you get inland that the local smiths can compete. In fact, there's a, there's a great uh, letter from George Washington back to his, uh, his agent in England, and he's complaining. He's really mad. He says, I ordered these farm tools last fall, and you never sent them. And now it's too late to get them from you, and I have to go find someone locally and have them made at double the cost. So he was furious. <laughs> but the yeah, <laughs> except except. It, the stuff was good quality. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, I think it was often better than what you could get locally because the guy that made this lock made 10,000 of them. He wasn't scratching his head trying to figure out how to make one. Was there not a consistency in quality? Well, there's, there's never, you're dealing with humans the, con the consistency and quality is, well, uh, to me that's actually a really important question because when you start studying old stuff, that's one of the things you have to learn is what is the allowable quality range, what is the industry standard for that kind of thing. And so there's always, a, there's always a range of quality, no matter when, where, or what you're looking at. Sometimes it's intentional to make things lower price or higher price. And sometimes it's just the variation between two different makers, or the same maker on two different days. So it's hard to answer your question in more than the abstract. But yes, there, you look at old locks, they vary. Uh, and that's one of the fun things to look at is where some people cut corners without uh, trying, without it showing. So I'll, I'll tell you, if you remind me when I'm making some of these parts, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. But um, Interesting lock story is 
Jack Klum rebuilt all the ironwork around the Hawaiian uh, Royal Mausoleum. And some of the gates were missing, but some of them were still there. And he, I guess it was built in the 1800s sometime. And uh, he had pulled one of the gates apart and, and one of the locks, surface mounted lock came mm -hmm. off and he opened it up and there was a name cast into mm -hmm. the body. And he, it was some, you know, Acme Lock Company in England. Right. Well, he researched it. They were still in business. Yeah. And he bought that lock, <laughs> you know, to rebuild right. the, uh, uh, gates that you know, that's, had disappeared. That's pretty nice. And he got the original locks. Yeah. Still well, from the same maker. Years yeah. Later. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's why they lost the war. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. I it's. <laughs> It's, 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 uh, yeah, I, it was an accident. Um, I was, um, I was coerced into going to take a blacksmith class. I had absolutely no interest in it whatsoever. I was 17. So I went and tried it and, uh, oh, well, that's kind of interesting. So I went back the next week and the next week and the next week. And, Oh, this will be uh, this will be a good. Some of you'll get a kick out of this. So uh, the teacher was Steve Kane from Kane and Sons. Oh, yeah. well, oh, okay. So he gave me my first lesson. So this is a six-week class, one night a week, at a local museum. The first night, he taught us how to light the fire, and uh, we made a drive-in hook, you know, with a twist in the middle. Second week, we already knew how to light the fire, but he taught us how to make a drive-in hook. Third week, we made a drive-in hook. <laughs> that was it. That was the whole <laughs> curriculum. <laughs> Did the hooks get better? Uh, yeah, they did. But that's all we learned to make. So <laughs> anyway, that's what, that's what got me started. So well, then. I, I didn't know anyone who had a forge or did any of this stuff, but there was a local museum, and I ended up volunteering there while I was in high school uh, one day a week so I could work in their shop, because that was the only way I could figure out how to do more. So they already had a, an existing shop, and they had a guy that knew more than me, and they had old stuff to copy, and that was our job. You know, well, we need two of these for that house, and we need one of those. So, and no, no time limit. So I thought that was, in retrospect, I think that was a really good way to learn because, uh, I mean, I was struggling to teach myself, but at least I had an example of what I was supposed to achieve. So I didn't have to figure out, is this good enough? I could tell right away if it was good enough or not. Uh, I still had to struggle to figure out how to do it, but, and that's what got me interested in historic work. So working in that, the more of these kinds of things that I worked on, the more interested I got in how they're used and what, the, what kind of setting they were in. And so that's what steered me into historic reproduction work. How did you get at Williamsburg? Well, after I had worked for several years, I also worked for a year for a superb smith named Dick Everett. And then I had my own business for a few years. And then uh, the man who had run the blacksmith shop in Williamsburg was ready to retire. So they started looking around for replacements. So I put in an application. And I guess all my friends who were better smiths than I knew better than to try to go to work there. <laughs> So, so my job at Williamsburg was really to start the, uh, the program of, of careful, accurate reproductions. Prior to that, the previous master had mostly made souvenirs. And uh, so they wanted to, that was a good time for me to go because it was a, they were making a big philosophical change in the shop activity and, and direction. And so uh, I was supposed to, um, spearhead that. So it's, it's always exciting when you're starting a new program 
you know, everyone's excited and get to do all the things that everyone's been waiting for someone to do. So it was a nice time to be there. With all your research, what would you consider your greatest discovery? Uh, pieces that came together that kind of the aha moment? Yeah, um, I'm going to talk a lot about that, but it wasn't an object. The, the objects, even these locks are actually good examples. They, my aha moment wasn't about so much about how to make a lock as it was about how do you make, how do you think differently in a pre-industrial culture than you do in a, in a industrial culture. So it's a, uh, so I'll give you just a hint at that. Um, In, in the modern, in a modern industrial society, all of us have learned, whether you tried to or not, you have learned the fundamentals of mass production and you have taken them as gospel. And one of those fundamentals is you figure out a way to make, if you have to make a number of things, you figure out a way to making them uniformly so that they're almost interchangeable or they are interchangeable. And that's where you spend your effort. You design a jig or a fixture or a system that churns out numbers of these parts that are all the same. Um, and then the assembly is easy. If you've done your, done your jigging and your production right, the assembly is a breeze. They just drop into place and you're all set. And that's great when you have tools that allow you to make parts that are almost interchangeable or are interchangeable. But these tools don't make interchangeable parts automatically. So the first time I tried to make a lock, I tried to make interchangeable parts or I had to make a batch of locks. I tried to make interchangeable parts by really fussing over the forging and filing and careful measuring. And eventually, I, after a lot of banging my head against the wall, I realized it wasn't because I was a bad workman, it's because I was a foolish workman. I was trying to do something with this process that it never was intended to do. I was trying to make industrially interchangeable parts with a hand process, and that's foolish. You never can do it efficiently, never, never, never. Even if you can do it just to prove something, all you've proved is you, you spent enough time doing it. But it's not a, an efficient way to work. What's efficient when you're working by hand is not to try to make the parts interchangeable, but to come up with a system that allows you to assemble different size or different shape parts without, without a problem. And so that's, that's what I learned from making locks, is that you just, you make the parts, you forge the parts, but you don't have to spend time making them all the same. You come up with a way of assembling that allows you to put one size bolt in that lock and a slightly different size bolt in the next lock without any problem without any more time or effort. And, and often it's just a matter of using your compasses and you say, okay, that notch has to be that far from the case and so that's where you cut the notch. So you're gonna cut that notch that way whether all of them are exactly the same or whether you have to change your compasses from one to the next. It still, it doesn't take any more time when you're using hand tools like that to make them all different as it does to make them all the same. And so that's, that was my aha moment, is that working in the 18th century by hand was a completely different philosophy and approach to the work. It, it wasn't... They didn't have the industrial philosophy yet. So exactly, exactly. Or the way of achieving it. It didn't exist and they didn't have to get over it. Yeah. Right, right. Was there a time in your life where mentally you turned off the electricity? 
No, I never turned off the electricity. To me, this is, well, it's like, um, you know, let's say one of you, one of you decides you want to go to France and you've got to learn to speak French. So, or you want to study French culture. It doesn't mean you stop speaking English. You're just learning about another world. And that's what I feel about this. I'm, I'm not rejecting any of the modern stuff that I know. I'm just adding the understanding of this as a, as a different culture. So I'm, I, I have lots of electric tools in my shop, and I use them when they, see, when they make sense to me. Well, everyone says that, but, but I still think there's a place for them, even when you're making stuff like this. Uh, what I worry about is what does it look like when it's done, and, and most modern tools give me the wrong result, and that, that's the only reason I wouldn't use them. Not that they're not good tools. But. Yeah. Could you talk about collections at Colonial Williamsburg, and could anybody here go in to research stuff there, or is that pretty close just to the employees? No, most museums have. Yeah. Uh, the question was um, can anyone go look at the collections at Colonial Williamsburg? And uh, in my experience, there are, you know, eight or ten big museums on the East Coast like Williamsburg or Winterthur or the Boston Museum of Fine Arts or they're all there are all these places that have decorative arts collections and anyone normally can go and look at things in the collections in storage that aren't on display if you make arrangements ahead of time and you agree to uh, their code of behavior. So, I mean, it's like going to your fussy aunt's house. You know, you, as long as you don't put your feet on the white, you know, on the table and spit in the corner, you can go. But, so you have to learn what the code of behavior is and give them the confidence that you're going to follow it. But you can call the curators and say, you can't, you can't just say, I want to look at your collections, I'll be there next week. You have to have something that you're looking for, because they have, you know, 800,000 objects. Yeah. You're wasting their time if you just want to wander around and, you know, window shop. Well, no. When I go to those places, I say I want to look at, I want to look at candle stands from New England that fit in this time period. And they'll say, well, we have two, or we don't have any, or we have three. One's on loan and one's on display. You can't touch that one. And then you say, well, can we make an appointment to look at the third one? I'll need, I would like to have about an hour and I would like to make some sketches and tell me what your procedure is. But yeah, anyone can do that. Does they write in with a screwdriver in your hand? <laughs> <laughs> just, just a plastic one. <laughs> just a plastic one, it won't scratch. Yeah, I mean, often you, if you go, you want to go measure the thing, you can't bring metal measuring tools because that could scratch the piece. You have to, you have to be prepared to treat the piece the way as well as they treat it. And if you are, then they are happy to share the knowledge and the ex and the experience. But they're not going to let someone in that's likely to damage the piece in any way. Yeah, that's a hard question. How, how, how long did these designs stay the same and how frequently did they change? Uh, this particular kind of lock stayed pretty much the same for about 60 years. The one big exception was the design of the spring, which changed in the middle of the, about in the middle. But the outside looked the same. There might be one or two other subtle differences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Did you, you had a question earlier. Material, um, how was the availability of stock um, in England and or in the colon colonies? Right. What was available? Uh, well, if you were, there were certain regions in England that were concentrated on lock making and there were sometimes towns that 90% of the workmen were locksmiths. And Wolver, well, Wolverhampton, Willenhall, I think Willenhall was probably the best. There are little towns, you know, a town of 2,000, 3,000 people, and they have 195 locksmith shops. So they're not just making locks for people that live in Willenhall. They're supplying the English Empire. Uh, and in those regions, I think you could get any, you could get the sheet, the right thickness. These locks have a tapered rail, which I'm going to do this morning. I'm, I'm just about to start on that. Uh, you can see the side rail. Well, let me, if you want to zoom in on this. Uh, yeah, you can see the, the side rail is thicker at the bottom than at the top. So I think that was rolled to that shape and just sold as strips. So I just heard, is that cast? Is no, there's no castings in this except for the brass parts. Everything else is wrought. So why did they make ro tapered edges? It's a lot of extra work. Uh, I think mostly it was for looks. When the case flares against the door, the earlier versions have untapered rails. They're just a rectangular box. How, how, how did you determine that that was the earlier version and this is the later version? By, by finding a few on different period houses. There are no dates in the locks. So you, that, or sometimes by archaeology too. But yeah, so you, there is no, I don't know of a, a document source that tells you all this. It took 10 years of... Are you a document source now? No, I'm a verbal source. <laughs> but, <laughs> and I can, yeah, the reason I... I know that no one out here is going to question anything I say. So <laughs> I, can, I can say anything I feel like and I just am confident enough. Yeah. So, um, like, what is the price difference What's the price difference between, you know, your three bolt lock down to like just your simple lock? The uh, well, a closet lock. Let's say let's compare this to a closet lock, uh, which would be a single bolt, no brass, and hmm? single knob. No knob. No knob. No knob. Closet lock is often just a single bolt. You you lock it when so you're, key. yeah, key operated. One bolt. You're running out of tape? No. What? Do you know anything about the brazing and the period, how they did the... Yeah, let me, I'll answer that in a second. So, um, so the difference in between just a single bolt lock and this three bolt lock with brass knobs is, is probably uh, four to one for the fancier one. And, and a latch would be a half the cost, or even a third the cost of the single bolt lock. So there's a tremendous difference between a thumb latch and one of these. Yeah, tremendous. Yeah? When you were talking about the material, would those small town sources then distribute their stock? Oh, sure. Wide spread? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would say the big difference between buying material now and then is uh, there were fewer sizes and shapes available then and it took longer to get it. But otherwise you could get no overnight air. <laughs> not even overnight wagon. <laughs> so most of what they were using here would have been standard dimensions. Well, to start with, but it doesn't mean that any of the parts left are, remained that dimension. I think the other characteristic of old work is that 
the stock gets completely reworked in making the thing. Okay. So you, you, if you measure a part in this, you go out and you order that size material, you won't be able to make that part. That part started as something slightly different than what it ended up. And yeah. where it's another question about brazing. Yeah. So the way you braze uh, is in the fire, and they just use yellow brass usually as the brazing material, and borax as flux. Uh, and so brazing, in fact, the wards in the lock, that, that circular ward is brazed into the ward plate, and that's the way the old ones are done. That's, you somehow figure out a way of fastening, mechanically fastening the pieces together so they don't shift. And either it's with a, a pin that holds it in place or a tenon or a wire wrapped around it. Uh, you get the parts assembled and, and somehow fixed so they don't shift. And you put the whole thing in the fire and when it gets close to the brazing temperature, you sprinkle on a little brass and flux. And once it melts, you take the piece out. You're done. So that's the brazing procedure. It's very quick. Uh, the, big, the big difference between then and now is having to mechanically hold the pieces in their alignment while the brass is melting. Having to, f when I braze with a torch now, I can just rest the things and not have to mechanically fixture them. But, but when you do it in the fire, you have to turn it. You can't use gravity to hold pieces in there correct. Yeah? Uh, more, uh, more of a philosophical question. If you look at industrial era and beyond, you know, we see constant innovation catalogs with people always advertising how they've changed something to make things better. Was that happening as much here, or were people more using tried and true, proven things, especially given the time lag of knowing right. what you're getting? Yeah, these kinds of designs changed very slowly, and the products lasted a long time. You know, a lock like this, uh, there are still many houses on the East Coast that have had the original locks on the same door for 200 years and they're still functioning. They're starting to wear a bit, but they're still functioning. And so the impetus, the, the, there wasn't a lot that was going to deteriorate. And there wasn't a lot of impetus to improve it every two years because what they had was very durable. And, and so, and also when you're making things by hand, it's very difficult to change methods quickly. It's taken you eight or ten years to learn to do that efficiently. When you, if you change something drastically, you're going to have a big uh, lag before you get back up to your previous income level. Did they, did they borrow? In other words, you have an English community here and a German community. Yeah, some, sometimes there's interchange between them. Sometimes the Germans use English door locks and German chest locks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Have there been studies concerning price relative to the average wages of the day? Yeah. It's, what did it cost a man in, in hours right. of, of labor to, or days of labor to, to buy a given thing? Uh, that is probably the question that more historians would like to be able to answer than any other question. And so far, there hasn't been a good answer or study. It, uh, it's, it's just, it has been, it turns out that it's very difficult to translate what you think of as a certain value and compare it to what they might have thought the value of that was. Um, and, and partly, I think that's because uh, we we have we can we have a, a thousand things that we consider essential purchases that didn't even the notion of them didn't exist. 
So they had far fewer things to spend money on. I mean, food, housing, entertainment, uh, but but there are so many things that you that if you just looked at those categories, you know, housing now includes uh, you know like a thousand different things. How many things are in a, everyone's bathroom, club cupboard that of course are everyday essentials. That's part of what it costs to live now. But it, it, it's just not easy. You have to take my word for it. It's not easy to make a cost value comparison. Yeah, uh, that's also, I'm going to, let me answer this one last question, then everyone's going to stand up and stretch their legs, and then I'm going to start making lock parts. So uh, we had the records from one store that was built, and they, because it was built as a business, they kept records for the home office. So uh, about 10% of the cost of the building was the ironwork. That was nails. Nails were probably about uh, six or seven percent. The other three or four percent was locks and hinges. Uh, Fifty percent of the cost of the building were the chimneys and the fireplaces. The masonry. And then the remaining 40 percent was the woodwork sawing and carpentry and construction. Related question to Dave. I heard that burning down houses to save the nails is actually folklore and not Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think burning down houses to get the nails is mostly a, a cute story. I, I haven't heard, I haven't seen much real documentary evidence for that. Yeah. Did they use like metal or rod iron structural members? Like Very rarely. Yeah. All right, everyone stand up. Uh, well, cast iron, you can't make cast iron this thin. Yeah, but steel was really expensive. Yeah. Well, the incentive wasn't there. You could have cast that, but it was cheap to forge it. Labor, labor was cheap. I mean, well, and in the colonies it was not as cheap, but it was still cheaper than trying to make a casting of that. Yeah. The question about um, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Changes. In, in, the, in the production and then, you know, was there innovation? I've been of the impression for a while that styles, cultural style changed much faster than, say, ways of producing. Oh yeah, I think you're right. There was more often catching up with what the latest fashion was. How yeah. To make the latest fashion. This is, this but is most hardware was not uh, very stylish, and so it didn't keep up with changes in fashion. Clothing did. Yeah. Clothing did. Architecture did. Uh, silver, but ju but most iron work was not really tied to fashion very closely. Yeah. 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 And, and, well, and even then, those kinds of shapes hold on, you know, for 20 or 30 years. They don't change every three months. Right. Right. for you. Furniture was a lot more stylish, high-end furniture. Um, so, uh, one of the things I was fascinated by being younger was, you know, the weaponry, like say the Viking and medieval. And I noticed in reading about that, the look changed. You know, it, it took a period of decades. You know, but the examples, the look would change. It seemed like there were certain right. styles that evolved. And sure. The, yeah, the, yeah. The methodology of producing something didn't change so much, but the right. look did. Right. Are you considering this for Yeah. Because I don't know if I have enough. 
tape for the second session if I do play with Tron. Probably be a good time to change the disc one. Yeah, well, we so you have another half hour? Uh, I, well, we go to 12, right? Yeah, 11.45, but 11 close to 12. Okay. Well, okay. well I, we can stop for five minutes and change. You, you just tell me and I'll, we'll all hold our breath. That's all you have to do, right, is pop in a new. Well, I finalized the ones that are in here.